So it's 2021 and you want to know the best specs for video editing, whether it be 1080p or 4K video editing, even all the way up to 6K. Well, in this video, I'm going to walk you through some benchmarks of computers that I have benchmarked here on my channel, kind of show you the charts and see where they fall. And then I'll actually explain each of the specs. So RAM, GPU, CPU, and storage. So we're going to see all of that here in this video. Hope you enjoy. So first and foremost, we're going to go ahead and look at the export times and see you know, which ones fits your needs. And then I'll, I'll jump over to DaVinci Resolve. So if you wanna hang on and look at these export times, go ahead and pause the video, but I'm gonna move forward to DaVinci Resolve now. Looking at DaVinci Resolve, we have the export times here on a myriad of laptops that I've reviewed over the past few months. If you wanna look at these, pause. I'm gonna continue on to 4K playback. For 4K playback, you see that most dedicated GPU equipped laptops are getting zero drop frames in Premiere Pro. The area where you're seeing laptops start to get drop frames is going to be either in the lower end of like the 1650 or 1650 Ti, as you see with the HP Pavilion here, it has some drop frames, or you're going to see uh, drop frames in laptops without dedicated GPUs at all. And this is for 4K video editing. If you're going for 1080p, you're going to see very little drop frames from the 1650 and from the laptops without dedicated GPUs. Technology's coming a long way, and we're seeing great performance out of that for 1080p. All right, pause, look at it, otherwise we're moving on. Let's jump into these specs for 1080p and 4K video editing. We're gonna talk about the processor, the GPU, the RAM, and the storage. First and foremost, let's talk about CPUs. For 1080p, I'm recommending on the rise inside, the 4700U, the 5700U, the 5800U, the 4600H, and the 5600H. All right, we're gonna pause, you can pause it here, but I'm gonna talk through this a little bit. If you're somebody who's on, you know, entry level to mid 1080p video editing, I'd recommend any of the mobile U processors is totally suitable. If you're moving up to more complex 1080p video editing, maybe a couple different camera angles, a lot of motion graphics, I would lean you towards the H series processor, okay? And we're gonna explain H versus U here in just a minute. For the Intel side, you have the i7-10510U, the i7-10710U, the i5-1135G7, the i7-1185G7, and the i7-1165G7. Again, those are for more light 1080p. And then moving up to more intense workflows, you're going to have the i5-10300H, or now the i5, I think it's 11400H is the latest one coming out here in a couple of months. Now, moving on to 4K, as far as AMD Ryzen is concerned, I'm looking at the 5600H from Ryzen, the 5800H, the 5900HS, and the 5900HX. Now for 4K from Intel, I'm looking at the i5-10300H or the i5-11400H for more entry-level 4K. And then moving up into the more uh, mid-range to advanced 4K video editing, we're looking at the i5-10750H, the 10875H, the 10870H, the i5-11400H, like I said, the 3075H, the 11800H, the 900H, and the 950H. Okay, so that's starting at basic 4K, moving up to advanced 4K. That's what we're looking at. Now, H series versus U series. This is very important. Make sure you're identifying the H when you're making a purchase for 4K. It's just, without a doubt to me, H series processors are the high performance processors equipped with a higher TDP. That means they have a higher heat limit and heat tolerance, as well as a bunch of other things. And if you're here and you're technically super smart watching this video, this video is not necessarily for you. This video is for people who are just trying to get their bearings around, you know, CPUs and GPUs. Okay. So just bear with me for not a super in-depth explanation. I have those videos on my channel if you're interested and you can go check them out. But basically, you're just going to have more performance, it's going to be able to maintain higher heats for a longer period of time, maintain higher frequencies for a longer period of time. Those H series processors are the go-to and the de facto for 4K video editing. Okay. Mobile processors are often seen in business laptops. And whereas H series processors are often seen in gaming laptops and high performing professional workstations. The mobile processors, like I said, can boost up to similar speeds as their H series counterparts, which is why often you'll see something like the i7-1165G7 winning out in simulated benchmarks for super high clock speeds. It'll be beating out an H series processor because it can peak up to that high. However, it can't maintain those performance and temperatures for long, it starts to drop back down, which is why the H series wins out. It can maintain higher levels for a longer period of time. Plus H series processors are the processors that come equipped with dedicated GPUs. 
this just new talk that we're seeing something like the Swift X with a mobile series processor and a dedicated GPU. That's pretty new. We haven't seen that much in the past. We're going to see how it works for these brands as they start coming out more and more. All right, moving on to the RAM, which is random access memory. Never say RAM memory together. You'll get hated on by the internet. I say RAM memory all the time. It's a filthy habit. And people hate, hate on me for it. It's either RAM or memory. Never RAM memory. Saving you some time there, Spaniard. Just movie quote, never mind. Um, every time you open an application, it is going to pull away from your RAM, okay? So let's say you have 16 gigs of RAM. You open up web browsing, two to five gigs of RAM, Premiere Pro, four to eight gigs of RAM, After Effects, three to six gigs of RAM, okay? Right there, you could already be above your 16 gigs of RAM, okay? So that's why for me, I recommend for pretty smooth 4K playback in Premiere Pro or DaVinci Resolve, I recommend 16 gigs of RAM. It is just a great standard. If you're somebody who wants to kind of up the limit and kind of get a higher ceiling for 4K video editing, I'd go 32. But 16 gigs of RAM is a great entry point. I know 32 gigs of RAM can get expensive, but um, for me, eight gigs is fine for 1080p and even some light 4K. But if you want the best experience, um, you can you would go with 16 and be good with that. That's my recommendation. All right, moving on to the graphics processing unit. Do I need a GPU for 4K video editing? Without a doubt, you need a GPU for 4K video editing. You're gonna have people tell you that I'm crazy, I'm lying in the comment section below. It just is not true. Dedicated GPUs are a must for 4K video editing. Um, it's just it's just what it is. You're, you're processing a ton of information and the GPU is built to handle the processing of tons and tons of information and it's able to display it up on your screen. There's just so many benefits to having a dedicated GPU, especially if you're gonna be video editing with motion design, okay? What does the GPU do? It helps support the CPU. It also helps run multiple external monitors. So if you're somebody who's running multiple external monitors, you can highly benefit from a GPU. So basically the CPU has all the information and it says, wow, that's a lot of graphical computation that's taking place. I'm not built for that. In fact, I'm built to run everything else really well together. So, hey GPU, I'm gonna send you all of this graphical information and you're gonna work on it for me. So what that does is it helps the CPU free up space and run faster and more efficient and the GPU can run the things that it's good at fast and efficient. Dedicated GPU is very, very important. It should really be called a VPU because I know a lot of people get confused or like, well, I'm a graphic designer. Don't I need a graphics processing unit? But it really is more motion graphics. So motion, so it'd be video files and motion graphics uh, from like After Effects or Blender or whatever it might be. Um, that's where a lot of confusion comes in. So to me, it's more of a VPU. SSD versus HDD. I'm gonna just say flat out right off the bat, SSD is the way to go. They're more stable. They will not break as easily and they have faster read and write speeds. Okay, so this is how I explain the differences. A SSD is just a basically a big thumb drive. There's no moving parts where an HDD has those moving parts. It's basically, it's a disc that spins then it has an arm that kind of moves around and read and writes the information with this little eye, okay? So this is how I kind of explain uh, how it works. So basically imagine me having uh, a thesaurus. I don't have a thesaurus in front of me, but if I did, I have a thesaurus and uh, I wanna find the word uh, optimism. So I open my thesaurus and I start to flip through and I'm manually looking for the word optimism, right? There, got it, whatever that means, as in the, the actual definition. Versus me pulling up my phone and searching optimism definition, boom. And it's, it's just right there. So uh, the reason read and write speeds are often slower on an HDD is because it's having to kind of search for the information on the spinning disk. Whereas with the SSD, it just bam, goes and finds the information. That's a very, very elementary explanation. Somebody far more technical. If you want to explain how it actually works in the technical, please do so. But that's just for basic sake, not getting into super deep tentacles right now. Okay, next up is color accuracy. Let's talk through this because a lot of people, uh, when they're going from budget up to high end, they're wondering the color gamuts and color gamut ranges and what they should be looking for. Okay, color gamut is the amount of color your screen can produce, okay? Delta E is a certification that clarifies the level of accuracy at which your screen produces that specific range of colors. So color gamut is the range. Delta E is the accuracy of the reproduction within that range. Okay, so you'll see laptops with delta E uh, less than two. So the lower the number on your delta E scale, the more um, the more accurate those colors are reproduced on your screen. Okay, now RGB versus CMYK. These are two different color spaces. RGB 
is screens. Your screens can see red, green, blue, okay? Whereas print, when you have a printed piece of paper, this is a printed three by five card uh, with color on it, that is CMYK, cyan, magenta, uh, same, okay, cyan, magenta, yellow, and then the last one actually stands for black. It's just K. But if you had B, it'd be like, is it blue? No, it's K, it's black. Okay, so those are the two different color spaces, all right? Now let's talk about the different RGB classifications. We have Adobe RGB, we have sRGB, and we have DCI P3. sRGB is the smallest spectrum, okay? So as you can see on the example here on the screen, sRGB is the smallest spectrum. So if you have 100% sRGB, you have 100% of the spectrum that it's covering. Adobe RGB covers the largest spectrum and leans towards greens and blues. So it's going to most accurately reproduce those greens and blues. It's going to render out things a little bit more green and blue. Whereas DCI P3, also a popular um, but still smaller range than Adobe RGB leans towards yellows and reds. So those screens are going to have a little, if you have a stronger DCI P3 screen, it's going to be a little bit more yellow and red. Now, a lot of screens cover 100% sRGB, 100% Adobe RGB, and 100% DCI P3, some of the higher end screens. So these screens are going to have, you know, kind of a mix of range, and it just depends on the screen manufacturer and um, really what, what it is. And you can buy something like a Data Color Spider X. I'll link that below if you're interested and you can actually color calibrate your screen to your own preferences. What should you look for in choosing a screen? Well, if you're in the budget category, getting a screen with 100% sRGB is really the best you're gonna be able to do. They don't have, a, there's not a lot of screens in the budget category that hit the high end of Adobe RGB. But for me personally, if I'm looking for a screen, quality uh, measurement. I'm going to look for a screen that has the highest Adobe RGB color gamut range. That's going to be my goal. So if I can see in the high 80s and even up to 100s, that's a fantastic screen. I'm going to go for that. If I see low Adobe RGB, I might swear, uh, swear, might swear that screen off. I might swerve away from that screen a little bit. Um, but this is all relative of your budget and price point. But I wanted to explain the differences so you have all the information that you need here. If you want to know laptops that I would put my own money down on today, go ahead and clear tap the screen here. Otherwise, subscribe and ring the bell for future uploads just like this one. See you here in the next one.